Welcome back to your online video lectures. This chapter will be all about carbon and why it is able to build so many diverse molecules. We will focus on organic molecules and their ties to the origin of life, carbon's bonding capabilities, including hydrocarbons and the formation of isomers, and we'll finish off with functional groups. By the end of this chapter, you will be able to model and categorize the fundamentals of molecular structure and functions associated with living organisms. Specifically, you will be able to describe the importance of carbon and how it produces large, complex, and diverse molecules. And you will be able to describe the variety of functional groups that are key to the functioning of biological molecules. There's a reason why carbon has its own chapter in your textbook. There's something very special about carbon. It's like the Goldilocks of the periodic table in its size, in its valency, in the way it forms bonds, which allow it to be the backbone of organic chemistry. In fact, organic chemistry is the study of compounds that contain carbon. You probably hear the word organic used to mean that a substance is naturally occurring, but in fact it just means that a compound contains carbon regardless of its origin. And where does carbon come from? Just as recent as July of this year, 2020, scientists have found evidence that the majority of carbon was formed in white dwarf stars. Carbon is abundant in the sun the stars, comets, and in the atmospheres of most planets. It's the fourth most abundant element in the universe by mass, the 14th most abundant element on Earth, and the second most abundant element in your body. We find carbon in different structural forms, which we call allotropes. Allotropes of carbon include graphite, one of the softest known substances, and my favorite, diamonds, which are the hardest naturally occurring substance that form under extreme temperature and pressure. But as I mentioned, carbon is also the backbone of the diverse molecules of life. It is found everywhere from cereal and pasta to clothing, furniture, plastics, and the air we breathe. So, how does one element find itself literally at the center of such vastly different molecules? That's what we will discover in this chapter. As I mentioned, carbon is the second most abundant element in our body. 18% of us by mass is carbon. Of course, it never exists solely as a carbon atom, as carbon atoms are highly unstable. The carbon is attached to other prevalent atoms, such as oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And carbon tends to be the backbone of these molecules. In fact, carbon is unparalleled in its ability to form large, complex, and varied molecules. For example, all proteins, DNA, and carbohydrates are composed of carbon. Other examples include fatty acid chains that make up fats and cell membranes, steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen, and carbon dioxide, which you release with each exhale. All of these and other compounds that contain carbon are called organic molecules. Again, organic chemistry is the study of carbon compounds. Organic compounds can range from simple molecules to colossal ones. Can you figure out what the longest molecule in your body is? But not only are carbon-containing compounds important to living things. They also tend to be made by living things. So this led scientists to question how the first organic molecules, which would later become the building blocks of life, were originally created. Stanley Miller performed this classic experiment, demonstrating the abiotic synthesis of organic compounds. Abiotic simply means it is not derived from living things. The experiment is simple. Miller began with seawater, which he boiled into a vapor. The water vapor rose and traveled to an artificial atmosphere containing CH4-methane 
NH3 ammonia, and H2 hydrogen gas. He then sent an electrical charge through the flask via an electrode. The vapor was cooled by a condenser creating rainfall. This rain was collected and analyzed for existence of organic molecules. Miller demonstrated that most amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, can be synthesized under similar abiotic conditions. Energy sources such as lightning and radiation may have helped to catalyze these reactions long, long ago. Interestingly, amino acids are found in meteorites and interplanetary dust particles. When they rain down through our atmosphere, they carry these building blocks of life, though not necessarily life itself. This experiment gives insight into what may have sparked the creation of those original building blocks of life long, long ago. There are a few key elements that comprise these building blocks of life. The most common element constituents of organic molecules are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, which tend to be found in uniform percentages across all species. In other words, humans, dinosaurs, and snails will all have similar percentages of C, H, O, N, S, and P. Just from these six elements alone, we are able to build a plethora of organic carbon-containing molecules. And again, this versatility is all due to the unique bonding capability of carbon. So let's dive into carbon and how to build molecules. The magic of carbon is due to one thing, its ability to make four covalent bonds in the second energy level. Of course, an atom's ability to bond is solely due to its electron configuration. So in order to fully understand and appreciate carbon's bonding ability, we have to take a closer look at the subatomic level. Let's do a quick review of carbon. This is called an electron distribution diagram. It depicts the electron configuration of carbon. Carbon's atomic number is six, meaning it has six protons. Its mass number is 12, meaning it has six neutrons in addition to six protons. To create a neutrally charged atom, if it has six positively charged protons, it will need six negatively charged electrons. We see the electrons pictured here in this model. We learned in chapter two that each ring around the nucleus is called an energy shell. The first energy shell is filled with two electrons. The second shell is filled with eight electrons. Carbon has a total of six, therefore two are in the first energy shell and the remaining four are in the second energy shell. Keep in mind that the electrons do not orbit the nucleus in a fixed circle like this. This is a Bohr model of carbon, named after the Danish scientist Niels Bohr. Notice how the electrons move around the nucleus without a particular pattern in what we refer to as an electron cloud. This simulation does not capture how incredibly small and fast electrons are. When scientists study electron movement, the electrons are so difficult to track and they appear to hop into and out of existence. The most important electrons of an atom are the ones that are in the outermost shell, which we call the valence shell. The electrons are called valence electrons. These are the reactive parts of the atom. Remember, each energy shell wants to be completely filled. This concept is called the octet rule. It is called so because this valence shell wants eight total electrons. Carbon already has four, so it wants four more to be filled and satisfy the octet rule. How do atoms gain more electrons to fulfill their octet rule? If you guessed by borrowing or stealing from another atom, you are correct. Whether an atom steals or shares electrons is dependent on the atom's electronegativity which is an atom's affinity for electrons. Many things factor into what determines electronegativity, but you don't have to worry about that. Just keep in mind that 
fluorine and chlorine are very electronegative and therefore they steal electrons forming ions. These ions then can form ionic bonds such as the NaCl salt compound. Oxygen and nitrogen are also very electronegative. If oxygen or nitrogen bond with carbon or hydrogen, which have lower electronegativities, they will share electrons and form covalent bonds with a polarity where oxygen and nitrogen are hogging the electrons, and we call this type of covalent bond a polar covalent bond. If atoms bond with atoms that have similar electronegativities or the same electronegativities, we again form a covalent bond, but here the electrons are being equally shared, and this is a nonpolar bond. Check out my video on Chapter 2 if you need a more in-depth explanation about this. So, now we understand that carbon has four valence electrons and wants to fill its valence shell with four more electrons. To do this, it will form four covalent bonds. Here are some examples. Methane is CH4. With this molecule, we see one central carbon with four single covalent bonds to hydrogens. Ethane is C2H6. When we build organic molecules, we always start with creating a chain of carbons. We see that in ethane, there are two central carbons attached with a single bond. Off each carbon, there are three single bonded hydrogens. Notice that the carbons each have four bonds emanating. Ethene or ethylene is a little different. Here we're introduced to double bonds. Notice that the two central carbons are now double bonded together. Each bond still provides the carbon with a shared electron. Each central carbon now has only two hydrogens emanating. Why do they have two bonded hydrogens each instead of three as we saw in ethane? Well, if we bonded three hydrogens to a carbon in ethene, the carbon would now have five bonds emanating, two from the double bond and three from the hydrogens. And remember, carbon must always only have four bonds. I also want you to note the structure of carbon-containing molecules. If we look at methane, which has carbon with four single bonds emanating, the atoms orient themselves into the 3D tetrahedron. The tetrahedron is the same shape as the triangular pyramids that you know of. It is a polyhedron, which means that it has the same shape and size on all four sides. Atoms like to orient themselves to be as far away from each other as possible because the electron clouds of each atom are repelling each other. The tetrahedron accomplishes this. Now look at ethane and ethene. These are two very similar molecules with one major difference, that double bond between the two central carbons in ethene. The 3D structures are very different because of this double bond. Imagine you are holding a ball and stick model of the ethane molecule you would be able to twist and rotate the two sides around that central single carbon bond. The same is true of the actual molecule. To contrast this, imagine you are holding an ethene molecule. Would you freely be able to rotate to the left and to the right around the central double bonds? Definitely not. You could bend it a little, but if you applied too much force or pressure, the bonds would break. And the same is true of the ethene molecule. Also note, due to the nature of that double bond, all atoms in that ethene molecule are on the same plane. They all lay flat on the surface shown. The atoms of ethane and methane are not planar because they are comprised of single bonds which are able to rotate freely around an axis. 
So now we know carbon has four valence electrons in its valence shell, and that carbon needs four additional electrons to satisfy that octet rule. It will also serve you well to set to memory the information for the other three most abundant elements in the human body, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. You may have noticed the word valence pops up many times in this lesson, and each with a slightly different meaning. Let's review quickly. We have valence shell, which is the outermost shell, which holds electrons. We have valence electrons, which are the electrons in the valence shell. And now we have just the word valence, which is defined as the number of covalent bonds an atom can form. Using carbon as an example, the valence shell is the second energy shell. There are four valence electrons and the valence is four because it can make four bonds. An atom's valence is determined by the number of unpaired electrons in the valence shell. Let's look at hydrogen. Hydrogen's atomic number is one. One proton will be in the nucleus. The mass number is also one. You may not have noticed this, but the version of hydrogen that appears on your periodic table is an isotope of hydrogen with zero neutrons. If hydrogen has one positively charged proton, it must also have one negatively charged electron for a neutral atom. This one electron is placed in the first energy level, which is also the valence shell in this case. So how many electrons does the first energy shell want? If you answered two, you got it. If you answered eight, remember eight electrons is for the second and third energy shells. So for hydrogen, the valence shell is the first energy shell. There is one valence electron and the valence is one. Take a moment to figure out the valence shell, valence electron, number and valence for oxygen and nitrogen. Oxygen's valence shell is the second shell. There are six valence electrons and oxygen has a valence of two, meaning it must form two bonds to satisfy that octet rule. Nitrogen's valence shell is also the second. There are five valence electrons, and nitrogen has a valence of three, meaning it must form three bonds to satisfy the octet rule. Now, all of this might seem a little tedious, but I promise it's important and it will help you if you understand this. Remember, electron configuration of atoms determines its ability to create bonds. Carbon has covalent compatibility with many different elements, the most frequent being hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and of course, carbon itself. Two examples of carbon partnering with non-carbon partners are carbon dioxide and urea. You now have all of the information needed to build the molecule urea. Take a minute and give it a try. Keep in mind the valence for carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Again, that's the number of bonds that each of those can form make sure that you form that amount of bonds. When you're done, look up the structure and compare to what you've made. As we dive further into how to build organic molecules, it will become clearer why earlier in this lecture, carbon was described as the backbone to life. Remember this rule. When building molecules, always start with the carbon, followed by the nitrogen, then oxygen, and lastly, we fill in the hydrogens. The first thing you want to do is form a carbon chain. Carbon chains form the skeletons of most organic molecules. Carbon chains may vary in length and shape. If you want some more practice with building molecules, try some of these. Keep in mind that there are often more than one way to string molecules together while satisfying their octet rule. I'll have the answers at the end of this lecture. We've discussed the omnipresence of carbon, its role in organic chemistry, 
and the importance of its ability to form covalent bonds and build these complex biological molecules of life. In box A, we see ethane again, a two carbon molecule. Next to it is propane, a three carbon molecule. Octane, which makes up the fuel for your tank, your car tank, is an eight carbon chain molecule. In box B, we see that chains may also contain branching off the main chain. Butane is a four carbon molecule. We can rearrange the butane molecule by removing one of the main chain carbons and placing it onto that central carbon. This creates an entirely new molecule called 2-methylpropane or isobutane. Note that both of these molecules have the same molecular formula of C4H10. These are called isomers, and we will revisit this idea shortly. In box C, let's look at double bond position. We were introduced to double bonds earlier with ethane and ethene. When we take the butane molecule present in box B and introduce a double bond, we produce butene. We have two options of where to introduce the double bond, either between the first and second carbon or the second and third carbon. Notice how if you placed it between the third and fourth carbon, you'd actually be creating the same molecule as when you placed it between the first and second carbon. Also notice that once you introduce a double bond, we needed to remove some of the hydrogens that are attached to the carbon so that we can always satisfy the octet rule. Carbon must always only have four bonds and hydrogen must always have one. You'll learn more about this in organic chemistry. In box D, we see the presence of rings. We can always take our carbon chain and form a ring. The smallest possible is three, but it is highly unstable and not often found in nature. The most common ring is the six carbon hexagon. Nature loves this shape. You find it in honeycombs as well. A six carbon ring with all single bonds is called a cyclohexane. A six carbon ring with three single bonds and three double bonds alternating has a special name and this is called a benzene ring. As you progress through the health sciences, you'll recognize this molecular structure on amino acids, pharmaceuticals, and lab chemicals. And this again is the benzene ring. All of the molecules that we've learned in this chapter have one thing in common. And that is that they are solely made of carbon and hydrogen. There was no other element present on any of them. These molecules are referred to as hydrocarbons. Notice even the word hydrocarbon contains hydrogen and carbon. Hydrocarbons are found in organic molecules such as fats, as well as fuels like the octane and propane molecules that we talked about earlier. A major characteristic of hydrocarbons is its ability to undergo reactions that release a large amount of energy. Take a moment to consider the two hydrocarbons that I just mentioned, fats and fuels. Our bodies metabolize fats for energy, and our cars metabolize octane fuel for energy. Here's an example of that fat molecule our bodies metabolize for energy. This is a triglyceride, or also called a triacylglycerol. In future chapters, we'll dive into the types of lipids and learn more about triglycerides. But for now, notice the structure of the triglyceride. There are three chains attached to a core. The three chains are called fatty acids and are completely comprised of hydrogen and carbon. So these are hydrocarbons. We store triglycerides in specialized cells called adipocytes. Adipocytes are easily recognized when we look under the microscope because they contain large fat droplets comprised of these triglycerides. The human body is adept at storing energy for times when there may not be sufficient food sources. This was an evolutionary adaptation 
and it may not be as essential as it once was for our ancestors, but it's still a part of our genetic makeup. So, I mentioned the term isomer earlier. Isomers are compounds with the same molecular formula, but different structures and properties. There are three types of isomers that we're going to look into, and they are structural isomers, cis-trans isomers, and enantiomers. Structural isomers are molecules that have different covalent bond arrangements of their atoms. You've already seen structural isomers. In this example, we have pentane, a 5-carbon molecule with the molecular formula C5H12. Next to it is another 5-carbon molecule with the very same molecular formula of C5H12. What's the difference here? The molecules have different covalent arrangements of their atoms. These two molecules will also have different chemical properties. Cis-trans isomers are molecules that have the same covalent bonds but differ in their spatial arrangements. Usually, you will find cis-trans isomers relating to double bonds. The cis isomer on the left contains the two X groups on the same side of the double bond, while the trans isomer on the right contains the two X groups on opposite sides of the double bond. And we have heard this term cis and trans with fats. We'll see that in the coming chapters as well. Enantiomers are isomers that are mirror images of each other. Think of it like your left and right hand. The left-handed molecule is called the L isomer and the right-handed molecule is called the D isomer. These might seem like minor differences, However, right and left-handed enantiomers have vastly differing effects in your body. Enantiomers are especially important in the pharmaceutical industry where two enantiomers of a drug may have vastly differing effects on your body. Usually only one of those enantiomers is biologically active. This slide shows two pharmaceutical drugs, ibuprofen and albuterol. Ibuprofen is the generic name for Advil. Only the S ibuprofen is effective here. This demonstrates the sensitivity of organisms to even subtle variations in molecules. Remember, structure and function are closely tied in biology. This would be a great place to take a break, review what we've already gone over, because the remainder of this chapter, we will be focusing on special groupings of molecules, which we call functional groups. Each functional group has distinctive properties that are key to molecular function, and these functional groups are found attached to the carbon skeleton backbones of organic molecules. Here's an example of how adding different functional groups to the same base molecule will result in vastly different molecular functions in the body. Pictured are the molecular structures of two important hormone molecules for female and male development. On the left, we have estradiol, a form of estrogen. Estrogen is paramount in reproductive regulation for females. On the right, we have testosterone, the hormone responsible for development of masculine traits. Notice the base structure is largely the same, a four-ringed steroid. We'll learn more about this structure in a later chapter. For simplicity, molecular structures are often drawn without showing the carbons in the carbon skeleton chains. You can assume that every corner of the hexagon and pentagon structures contains a carbon atom. Now pay attention to those functional groups. Estradiol and testosterone have two functional groups in common at the top right of the structure, a methyl, CH3, and a hydroxyl, OH. However, in the bottom left of the structure is where they differ. Estradiol contains a lone hydroxyl group, while testosterone contains a methyl group and a carbonyl. Seemingly small differences lead to vastly differing molecular functions in your body, and this is the role of functional groups. Functional groups 
are the components of organic molecules that are most commonly involved in chemical reactions. The number and arrangement of functional groups give each molecule its unique properties. We will learn the seven most important functional groups, and they are hydroxyl group, carbonyl group, carboxyl group, amino group, sulfhydryl group, phosphate group, and the methyl group. Group number one, the hydroxyl group. Hydroxyl groups are comprised of an oxygen attached to hydrogen. The single solid line emanating from the oxygen indicates a covalent bond. Remember, oxygen has a valence of two. The compound name for a molecule containing a hydroxyl group is an alcohol. You may associate the word alcohol with one particular substance, but it actually comprises an entire group of molecules. An example of an alcohol is ethanol. Notice its similarity to the molecule ethane that we discussed earlier. Ethanol is ethane with a hydroxyl attached to it. Ethanol is also called ethyl alcohol. Notice all atoms have the appropriate bonds to fulfill their valences. Carbon has four bonds, oxygen has two bonds, and hydrogen has one bond. Hydroxyls have their own set of properties. Remember, oxygen is a very electronegative atom, meaning it has a high affinity for electrons. In covalent bonds, the oxygens tend to hog the electrons that are being shared, which creates a polar covalent bond. Therefore, this functional group is also polar. Polarity due to electronegativity creates partial polar charges. Oxygen will have a partial negative charge and can therefore create hydrogen bonds with any surrounding water molecules present. Water is of course also a polar molecule itself. Group number two, the carbonyl group. Carbonyls are comprised of an oxygen double bonded to a carbon. The carbon can then have two additional bonds emanating. Two different compounds are formed depending on what is attached to that carbonyl carbon. If the carbonyl carbon is flanked by two additional carbons, the compound is called a ketone. If the carbonyl carbon is flanked by one carbon and one hydrogen, the compound is called an aldehyde. The simplest ketone is acetone, a substance often used in nail salons to remove polish. You may recognize other ketones by paying attention to chemical names. Ketones often end in own. For example, testosterone, lactone, and acetone. An example of an aldehyde is propanol. You'll notice this is a three carbon propane molecule that we saw earlier with the carbonyl instead of a hydrogen attached. The ending AL indicates an aldehyde. Sometimes the word aldehyde is also part of the name. For example, if you've ever heard of the molecule formaldehyde. It's a preservative molecule used to embalm. We also find ketones and aldehydes on sugars, and they are called ketoses and aldoses, respectively. We'll see more of this in the next chapter. The more you encounter molecular structures, you'll begin to become familiar with classification and naming convention, and when you take organic chemistry, you'll get a proper introduction to these conventions. Group number three, the carboxyl group. A carboxyl group is similar to the carbonyl group that we just learned about. In fact, carboxyls contain carbonyls. However, carboxyl carbons all contain an OH hydroxyl group on one side. The other side is usually attached to another carbon. Carboxyls act as acids. Recall from chapter three, that acids donate protons, hydrogen ions, which are essentially a single proton to solutions. More hydrogen ions in a solution leads to a decrease in pH and an increase in acidity. 
the carboxyl shown here is acetic acid, which is part of vinegar. Acetic acid is a weak acid that can release its hydrogen proton under certain acidic conditions. Release of the proton creates the ionized form of COO minus. Other examples of carboxylic acids are lactic acid, pyruvic acid, and citric acid. Notice the COO minus carboxylic acid groups on each of these weak acids. Group number four, the amino group. An amino group is comprised of a nitrogen attached to two hydrogens. Remember, nitrogen has a valence of three. It wants to make three covalent bonds to satisfy its octet rule. In the previous slide, we saw what makes up organic acids. On this side, we see what makes up a base. Recall from chapter three that bases accept proton ions in solutions. Less hydronium H plus ions in solution leads to an increase in pH and a decrease in acidity. Make sure you understand this concept of acids and bases. Now, look carefully at the example of the base glycine. Glycine is one of the 20 amino acids, which are the building blocks of our proteins. The amino group on the left side of the equation begins with a nitrogen covalently bonded to two hydrogen atoms and a carbon. This satisfies the octet rule. The power of the amino group is in its ability to take on an additional proton. We then see on the right side of the equation a nitrogen with four covalent bonds. This is more than its valence of three. It also has a charge now because it accepted the proton, which carries a one plus charge. The amino base begins as NH2, and once it accepts, the hydrogen proton becomes NH3 plus, and such compounds are called amines. Group number five, the sulfhydryl group. A sulfhydryl group is comprised of a sulfur atom and a hydrogen. Sulfur plus hydrogen gives you sulfhydryl. Molecules carrying the sulfhydryl functional groups are called thiols. An example of a thiol is the amino acid cysteine. Cysteine is one of the 20 amino acids used as building blocks for our proteins. One very important role of the sulfhydryl group of cysteine is to create cross-link bridges, which helps stabilize the 3D structure of proteins. And we will see this again in the next coming chapters. Group number six, the phosphate group. The phosphate group is comprised of a phosphorus atom surrounded by four oxygens. I do want to give you a disclaimer about phosphorus. Phosphorus's valence is three. It has five electrons in the outer valence shell. And yet you will notice that there are five covalent bonds emanating from that central phosphorus atom. This is called an expanded octet. It has 10 valence electrons now instead of the eight because phosphorus is hypervalent, which just means that it can hold more electrons than the normal. Just remember, there are always exceptions to the rules in biology, and you'll see this with some elements. I just don't want you to get confused. You'll also notice the two negative charge on phosphate groups. And why do you think this is? Oxygen atoms are highly electronegative and therefore have that high affinity for electrons. These phosphate groups actually begin with hydrogens attached. However, due to the high electronegativity, the oxygens hog the electrons. And the phosphate group is then very easily able to release two of the H plus protons into solution leaving two oxygens with a two negative charge. Phosphate groups are found throughout the body. Some notable places are within the backbone of our DNA and RNA as a part of our energy molecule, ATP, and phosphates have a very special role in activating and deactivating molecules. You'll learn all about that in biochem. And finally, we have group number seven, which is the methyl group. 
Methyl groups are comprised of a central carbon with three hydrogens attached. These are fairly small functional groups and are found on many organic molecules. The example shown here is 5-methylcytosine, which is a modified component of our DNA. Methyl groups have a very special function in gene expression. They can be added to or removed from a part of our DNA to activate or deactivate that part of the genome. We call this unique ability to regulate gene expression epigenetics. These compounds are then said to be methylated. To finish up this chapter, we're introduced to the energy molecule of our body, ATP or adenosine triphosphate. ATP stores the potential to react with water. So there we go. There's a little bit of potential energy in this structure. Such a reaction results in the release of energy, which can then be harnessed by our cells to do work. Note the structure of adenosine triphosphate in the simplified diagram shown here. We have the adenosine molecule attached to three phosphate groups. After the reaction with water, ADP is released, which is adenosine diphosphate, as well as the inorganic phosphate group we've just cleaved off of the ATP. It's called inorganic phosphate because it's no longer attached to a molecule that has carbon. Remember, organic molecules have to have carbon. We will discover how the body harnesses the power of ATP hydrolysis in a later chapter. The next chapter, we will discuss the structure and function of large biological molecules.